Craig Murray, you've been covering the case of Julian Assange for years. You've been one of his chief advocates in the UK. And now you're here in Washington, D.C. to continue the campaign. Do you think that he will be extradited here to the Washington, D.C. area to be placed on trial? Yeah. At the moment, he's lost his appeal to the High Court against extradition. Um, there was a very summary judgment uh, against him of just three pages from the judge dismissing his appeal. The appeal was 150 pages of close argument, <laughs> um, tremendously interesting documentation, you know, uh, in, including the spying on him and his lawyers uh, by contractors on behalf of the CIA, the Beecher uh, client attorney confidentiality, um, including the fact that the extradition treaty doesn't allow political extradition, um, they, including uh, attempts to kidnap and murder him, uh, orchestrated by the CIA, including the fact that the, the prime witness uh, for the prosecution is a convicted paedophile uh, in Iceland who's also been jailed for fraud uh, and who was paid for his testimony and was openly admitted he was paid for his testimony. Um, so, you know, there were some very strong points made in this, this lengthy 150 pages of argument uh, put forward by some of the best lawyers in the world, some of the best legal minds in the world wrote that document. And um, in three pages, this judge dismissed it all, uh, said that it followed no, no, no known laws of, of argument. Uh, he, he didn't bother to go through it. He just said it, it wasn't valid. Um, and he gave uh, them six weeks uh, to lodge an appeal against his decision that there should be no further hearing. Uh, and said that that had to be kept to 20 pages and that there would be a half hour hearing to decide whether there's any possibility of future appeal or whether it's all over. And that's, that's a half hour hearing, 30 minutes um, total. That's not 30 minutes for the defence. That's the length of time that hearing will, will take for the defence and the prosecution uh, and the judge. Um, so it seemed like it seems like they are possibly moving to very quickly uh, drawing this to a close and, and ordering extradition, and that could happen um, within the next few weeks. You, you know, in, in inside a five or six week time scale, it's perfectly possible Julian could be extradited to the United States because they could they could take him more or less straight from the court to the plane. Uh, the uh, the defence intends, if they don't win this next appeal, to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. But it's it's by no means certain that they'd be able to get a stay in time uh, from the European Court. And it's by no means certain, even if they did, that the, the British government would respect it. So he, he Julian could be extradited uh, in in a very few weeks. Do you think if Julian Assange is extradited to the U.S. and brought here, do you think he stands any chance of a fair trial? There's been no kind of fair trial uh, in the U.K. You know, the hearings in the U.K. have been have been farcical, frankly, um, and it makes me realise just how strongly the state wants to get him. I expect there will be elements of that in the United States. The the only saving grace possibly in the United States is that he will at least at the first trial here have a jury. Um, well, there's been no jury involved in any of the proceedings in, in, in the United Kingdom on extradition. Um, but then again, um, I understand that the, uh, the Eastern District of Virginia is specifically chosen for these kind of trials precisely because the jury pool uh, is extremely uh, conservative and extremely national security oriented and it's a community in which the economy of the community depends on jobs in national security. So um, no, that in itself prejudices the possibility uh, of a fair trial. 
Um, no, I mean, there's no doubt that the system, the judicial system, will be entirely loaded against him. It, it, it seems to me that's why we need a political decision to, to drop the prosecution. Uh, I think if the prosecution goes ahead, the chances of winning in court and the chances of a fair trial are pretty limited. What's it like going into Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison to visit Julian Assange? Um, and what does he say about the kind of treatment that he's received there? Julian remains optimistic um, and you know, remains determined to fight the case at every, at every level. And, and obviously at the moment we're concentrating on fighting extradition. Um, but, you know, I'm, he's very focused, uh, he's very aware, um, and he's very much in charge of his own defence, you know, despite the limitations on him of being held in a maximum security prison. He, he's still able to, to direct the, um, the legal team as, as to his wishes. Um, so it is very much him that, that, that's in charge of the legal pleadings, which I think is important. Um, but yeah, no, Julian remains optimistic and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say he's, you know, he's a fighter and he's, he's in a horrible situation, but he's not. Uh, he's not succumbed to it. He's still the same Julian that went in. Well, describe the situation as he, uh, that, that, that you witnessed. What's it like when you go to, to visit him? And what, what, is, what does he say uh, he's being subjected to? Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm banned not to, not to discuss that. I, 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 I'm for the first four years of his time in Belmarsh, I wasn't allowed in to see him. Uh, and they finally relented and allowed me in for the first time uh, in the last month or two. Uh, I, I've seen him twice in the last few weeks. Um, but that's on condition I don't talk about it. I don't discuss the conditions in the jail. Uh, I don't discuss the conditions in which he's being kept. And if I do, I won't be allowed in to see him again, presumably. Uh, so it, it's not exactly a non-disclosure agreement, but the, the, the view of a jail is they haven't been allowing any journalists to. The view of a jail is that I was allowed in as a personal visitor, not as a journalist, and I'm not to tell. I, and this is itself a, a ridiculous constraint on freedom of speech. It, it, this is itself an attack on, on my freedom of speech and, and, you know, and the right of the public to know. But I can't tell you, unfortunately, you know, about the regime. Because let me just say, it is, it's the maximum security prison in which Britain's most serious convicted terrorists are, are kept, and that may be gives you the idea. You spent a lot of energy countering the demonization of Julian Assange, the demonization of his character, the portrayal of him as a, not just a hacker, but as a, uh, a rapist, someone who's a political kook, a conspiracy theorist. He's not portrayed as a whistleblower. And yet one of his chief advocates is the most famous whistleblower in recent American history who was recently memorialized by the legacy newspapers, the Washington Post, the New York Times. That's Daniel Ellsberg. Why do you think Ellsberg is seen as the good whistleblower and Julian Assange is just so demonized by the same institutions? It's fascinating, isn't it? And um, I mean, I'm greatly honoured to have been a, a personal friend of, of both of them, of Daniel Ellsberg and, and of Julian. I think the first thing to say is if Daniel Ellsberg were doing today what he did then, Daniel Ellsberg would have gone to jail. Uh, you know, the world has changed an awful lot and the um, amount of uh, protection given to whistleblowers has, and, and the tolerance of freedom of speech for freedom of speech has um, has changed a huge amount. Uh, it's, of course, a fact that um, Barack Obama prosecuted and jailed um, more national security whistleblowers than every other president of the United States put together. Uh, the, the Obama administration really brought in the, um, the 
harsh persecution of people uh, in national security who leaked information that they they didn't want leaked, um, and and the weaponization of the Espionage Act, which had really been not the major tool used against whistleblowers. Um, the, uh, it was the Obama administration which really um, instituted uh, this form of, of, of crackdown. Um, so the, the acceptance of Ellsberg as a, as a national hero um, when Chelsea Manning wasn't accepted as a national hero, I think was was a question of the decade in which they did it, not not of any real difference between the act they did. Um, and then Ellsberg became a kind of legacy national hero. <laughs> and, and, and it was so entrenched that he was a good man who did a great thing. But there was no real appetite in the media to try to overturn that. He himself... Um, spoke very trenchantly on this. He utterly rejected the idea that he was the, the good leaker and that Assange was the bad publisher. Um, and Daniel Ellsberg pointed out, he, he stated, that um, all the nonsense that's talked about WikiLeaks putting US assets or US personnel at risk um, this was no more true of what WikiLeaks released than it was true of what he released. Uh, he was actually asked in court, when, when cross-examined in court, when giving evidence on behalf of, of Julian Assange, um, the counsel for the US government actually put this to him, but you, you know, it said, you were very careful, you, you omitted uh, four volumes of the Pentagon Papers in order to protect identities. Um, was. Uh, WikiLeaks recklessly revealed identities. And Ellsberg said there are several answers to that. He said, the most important one is that the four volumes I, I didn't release were, was not to protect identities at all. That, that wasn't a factor. And he said, and I revealed plenty of identities in all the volumes I did release. He said, I even revealed the identity of a CIA agent who was one of my closest friends. Because uh, I, I thought it was important that information stayed in, and I um, uh, the four volumes I redacted, I actually redacted because they contained information that could have destroyed peace talks. Uh, that's why I held them back. So that's not true. So uh, plus, there's been no evidence ever presented that anybody ever came to danger from WikiLeaks. No, who has been killed? Name the person who was killed as a result of WikiLeaks revelations. Um, and in fact, uh, as Ellsberg pointed out in the trial, as Daniel pointed out, he said that the um, uh, the submission on behalf of the United States by uh, Deputy Attorney General Kronberg actually states that the United States has no evidence of an individual being harmed. Uh, so you know, that kind of distinction, the idea that Julian did something that put US people in danger, whereas Daniel Lillsburg didn't, he utterly rejected that. And, uh, and it is extraordinary the, the way that this kind of artificial way the media tried to make this distinction between the two acts of whistleblowing. And of course, it was um, uh, Chelsea Manning who's a whistleblower, not Julian. Julian is a publisher, we should also not forget that. And what, what's happening now, if you want to make the parallel to the Ellsberg case, it's not the equivalent, uh, you know, the proper equivalent is between Julian and the editor of the New York Times. Uh, at the time of Daniel Ellsberg, that, that would be the genuine equivalent. You're, you, you yourself were actually put on trial and imprisoned. Uh, and it's, an, it's another commentary on the state of press freedom in the UK, obviously. But do you think that you were targeted and convicted because you were such a gadfly to the national security state around the issue of Assange and so many other intelligence intrigues? 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think I was I was jailed for my own whistleblowing on torture and extraordinary rendition. And then for my, my friendship with Julian and my campaigning for Julian and the work I do for other um, asylum seekers and people targeted by the British state. Um, I think all of that was, was behind it. I don't think the technical reason I was jailed was genuine at all. In, in, in fact, um, I was kind of picked out. And, and I, I should explain, I was jailed for jigsaw identification of complainers in a sexual assault case. Um, jigsaw identification means you don't identify them, you don't publish their names, but you publish information which, when added to other information in the public domain, could help lead to their being identified. Um, and just to give an example of how that works, I, I, one of the things I was jailed for was, was saying in an article that one of them had curly hair, uh, which is true, they did have curly hair. And it was, it was germane to the case because that particular accusation was that uh, Alex Salmond, the accused, the former leader of the Scottish National Party, but in an elevator, he had reached out to ping her curly hair. Uh, and that was the accusation. Um, how that becomes sexual assault, I do not know. These were people who knew each other quite well, and they were just messing about. And I should say, he, he never denied he, he reached out to ping, to, to ping her curly hair. And strangely enough, um, even the prosecution admitted he didn't do it. He reached out to ping the curly hair and then changed his mind and didn't do it. Um, but, and that was the claimed sexual assault. So I, I published an article and I said, you know, these are, this is how crazy these charges are. This is one of the charges, but he reached out in an elevator to ping the curly hair of this lady, but didn't actually do it. Um, and I was jailed for saying she had curly hair because that could help identify her. Well, I mean, so do how many million other people? <laughs> how is that identified? What the judges would say was, well, obviously she was work, somebody who had worked closely with Alex Salmon, so if you go through, you know, it was narrowing things down. And, and um, But I, mean, I certainly didn't publish it intentionally to identify the woman. And the main thing is, of course, he was found not guilty on all charges. Uh, because the charges were a concoction of two things. There were, there were a number of stupid charges, like pinging her curly hair, which were thrown in to help build the case. Then there were a couple of serious charges of um, one of attempted rape, which is obviously an extremely serious event, uh, and, and one of sexual assault. And, um, and the truth of the matter is that he was former leader of a political party. He was the leader of the Scottish independence movement. And these false charges were concocted. It was a conspiracy to jail him. And the conspiracy, see, by state actors to jail him. And the police and the prosecution service were part of the conspiracy to jail him. Um, as indeed, in my opinion, was a judge. Uh, but fortunately, the jury saw through it all. The jury found him not guilty. Um, but that's what I was trying to report. I was trying to report and say, the state is falsely accusing this man. Uh, and so among the things I said was that, you know, these people, uh, the accusers are a small, tight-knit group of people who work closely with the, uh, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. This is her close inner circle are the people who are the accusers. And again, that, you know, that's part of what I was jailed for because that, that was said to identify them. But the fact is that they were committing perjury. They conspired together. They met together. They, they were WhatsApp messages of them getting together to, to collude with each other over the stories they were putting forward. Um, but you were not allowed to publish this. Nobody was allowed to publish that because it would help identify who they were. 
So the public, to this day, have no idea, mostly, um, why he was acquitted or what the evidence was, because no one was allowed. The media did not report the defence evidence. The BBC um, did a hatchet job documentary on the case in which they interviewed um, blacked out, who so couldn't see to identify, several of these people saying he was terrible and he was guilty. Um, and they did day by day coverage of a trial, day one, day, that was a format of a documentary. And they did the prosecution evidence, which I think from days one to seven, maybe from one to two, they went through day by day in, in detail. Then the defence evidence was on days eight, nine, and ten. And the BBC literally skipped from day seven to day 11. They didn't put in any of the defence evidence at all. So the public never saw why he was found not guilty. And you know, he obviously wasn't guilty. But there was, um, apart from the silly charges like pain coming here, on the most serious sexual assault rape thing, the lady in question was never in the building. She was not in the building that day. Um, this was the home of the First Minister of Scotland, the CCTV. She's not on the CCTV. She's not in the visitor's book. She claimed she was at dinner. She's not in the kitchen diary, but notes anybody who has dinner there, so the cook doesn't give them the same time. She, she wasn't there, uh, and they were eyewitnesses. Um, one of her very best friends, who had been at her wedding, gave, gave evidence to say that this lady had phoned her up to say she'd been invited to dinner, she couldn't go, would her friend go instead? And her friend went instead and was there and said, no, she wasn't there, I was there in her place, she did not come. And yet her testimony, you know, she got in the box and she swore, but she was there, she was at the dinner where nobody else saw her. Uh, and it was only dinner for four people. Um, and afterwards there was an attempted rape. And so in publishing de the detail that that cannot be true, again, I was found guilty of jigsaw identification um, because I'd said what day it was. Um, um, and so somebody could work out from that who this person was. But they weren't there, I don't see how. But they, um, um, it was that kind of thing. But you, I was prevented from exposing this. Or, 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 or I, that's not true. They, they prevented everyone else from exposing it. I exposed it. And so I was, I was imprisoned. But that's the... I'm, this was crazy. I, I, you know, people were horrified that, that I was imprisoned for that. Um, but... I think that was an excuse. Yeah, I, th I think it was my, my wider activism was the reason uh, why they actually wanted to get me. Uh, so you, you were covering the case of Alex Salman. Alex Salman was being put on trial as the in independence leader of Scotland, someone who was leading something the British state clearly opposed. Um, then you have you know, what happened to you, what's happened to Julian Assange, what we're seeing in the United States where these uh, January 6th defendants are going to getting sentences of over 20 years with terrorism enhancements. And in some cases, they aren't even accused of violent acts. Or in one case, the leader, the ringleader, uh, is, wasn't even present for the riot in the US Capitol. Do, do you think we're seeing a kind of systematic attempt to outlaw any form of protest that actually threatens the ruling order and uh, to do essentially wage lawfare on political elements that threaten the, the prevailing order of liberal democracy, what you could even call kind of a transatlantic regime. I think that's absolutely right. It, it is a systematic attempt to, um, to ruin people's reputation and to just lock up dissidents. Um, there, there's a, a huge wave of it in the in the UK. They, there's a new law just being passed on public order, um, which means that the police can ban any demonstration or public assembly if it inconveniences anybody. That's impossible to have a demonstration by inconveniencing somebody. You know, by there's been no point in having a demonstration if it didn't inconvenience somebody. Yes, you know, you've got 
5,000 people marching down the street. That's going to inconvenience cars that can't move that street at the time, uh, down, down the street at the same time. But that is sufficient reason for the police to ban the demonstration now because it inconveniences somebody. It may, may inconvenience for 10 minutes nearby shops so, uh, because people will say they couldn't get to the shop because the demonstration was in the way or something along those lines. But um, the right to public assembly has basically just been, been outlawed. You, know, you can only do it if it's somewhere on a, presumably the farmer's permission, on a field in the middle of nowhere where nobody's going to see it, so no one's going to be inconvenienced, or offend. You mustn't offend anybody either. Uh, and, and again, you know, if your demonstration doesn't offend the people you're, you're presumably demonstrating against or, or who are behind the policy you're demonstrating against, there's not much point in having the demonstration. So um, there are... Radical moves. There's a, there's a new online safety bill, which, which isn't really about safety. It's about censorship. Where internet service providers, you're, if you put out tweets or Facebook posts or, or, or blog entries that they don't like, that the state considers to be disinformation, they can fine your internet service provider, who of course is going to cut off your service and is going to stop preemptively people pushing posting things the government doesn't like to make sure they're not fined. Um, so, and we've had um, demonstrators, uh, particularly demonstrators against the Israeli weapons industry, we've had quite a rash of demonstrations in, in, in the UK against the we Israeli weapons industry, I've been, I've been, which has factories in the UK, I've been, I've been on such demonstrations myself. Um, and the people on those demonstrations are regularly being charged with criminal damage for, you know, spraying graffiti or whatever. Um, and they are they have been banned by judges from saying to the jury why they did it. Um, because there's an attempt to outlaw jury nullification. Uh, where a jury says, well, okay, you did that, but we think it was okay. Um, and their lawyers have been told that they are not allowed to present their client's motivation in court. They're not allowed to tell the court why they did it. Uh, and that that has now affected 30 or 40 trials in, in the UK, where the lawyers have not... And in fact, there's one lady who was herself jailed for six weeks for refusing and say, and she stood up in giving her own evidence and she insisted on saying why she did what she did. And she was jailed for contempt for six weeks just for saying why she did what she did on top of whatever sentence the, you know, the judge was looking to give her for the, um, the so-called crime itself. So there, there is this way. I mean, coming back to Donald Trump, it's astonishing to me. You know, we, who can say the United States is a democracy? And I'm, I'm no fan of Donald Trump. But what do you call a country where you have an election coming up? I'm, I'm no fan of Donald Trump. But what do you call a country where an election is coming up for president and the government's main tactic is to put the opposition candidate in prison so he, doesn't, he can't fight the election. You know, that's, that's exactly what they accused Russia of doing, precisely the same thing. Uh, that's exactly uh, what they, they call dictatorship. You know, it, and you could have a situation where at the same moment the United States is trying to put its own most popular presidential candidate in prison and trying to put the most famous publisher in the world in prison for publishing the truth. You know, this isn't democracy. This is absolutely not in any sense what, what, what any of the founding fathers or, or subsequent jurists or philosophers uh, who, who have contributed to the American Constitution. This is not what any of them meant. You know, no, and the United States has completely ceased to be a democracy without anybody noticing. It's quite extraordinary. And the entire media are asleep on the watches or, or cheering on. You know, the so-called liberals who should be defending democracy and freedom of speech are very happy that the opposition politician is going to be jailed because they don't like him and they don't agree with his policies. They, 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 forgotten completely that the whole point of freedom of speech and, 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 and old democracy is that 
you don't get to ban people you disagree with uh, and, and that people you disagree with have the chance to win the vote. But that, it, that seems to have collapsed in the States and it's collapsed most of all in um, the New York Times, the Washington Post and CNN and, 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 and CBS and, and the mainstream media. They, they have totally lost sight of what democracy means. Russia hysteria has been the background music uh, to this process of de-democratization where any dissident, anti, any anti-war dissident gets painted as kind of a Russia sympathizer. Uh, Donald Trump was painted as a Russian agent as part of the plan to delegitimize him in his election. It felt to me like Russia hysteria transitioned across the Atlantic through the Skripal affair in which the former double agent, Sergei Skripal, in Salisbury, England, and his daughter, Yulia, were supposedly poisoned by Russian agents, but it was a very suspicious case. And as the result of that poisoning by this substance, Novichok, in 2018, British citizens were told that they were attacked by Russia, and we saw anti-Russian hysteria escalate massively as a result. So you've written a lot about this affair and you've taken a very skeptical view of the official story. So explain that for us. Why do you not believe the official story about the poisoning of Sergei and Yulia Skripal, who are, by the way, now are um, essentially under witness protection. We don't know where they even are. Well, I think the, um, the most important single fact to remember about the Salisbury affair and what happened or didn't happen to a up is that by a total coincidence, in the whole of the United Kingdom, this just chanced to happen seven miles from the one, the one place in the United Kingdom which is admitted to make Novichok, <laughs> which is the government's chemical weapon research facility at Port and Dam, where they say they had in the past synthesized and made uh, Novichok in order to prepare defenses against it, of course, not in order to use it as well. So, you know, if you have, if it's true, that there was Novichok used to attack people in Salisbury, and you have a source of Novichok seven miles away, um, it seems to me strangely um, perverse to start looking for the source of the Novichok Z thousand miles away instead. That, that, that just seems to me uh, an extraordinary approach from the start. And I, um, I disbelieved uh, the British government from day one, because the day after these alleged attacks, um, Boris Johnson announced in Parliament, I think it was Boris Johnson, might have been Theresa May, but I think it was Boris Johnson, announced in Parliament uh, that it was Russia and that the government laboratory at Port and Dan had confirmed that the Novichok was of Russian origin. Um, and I, you know, having been uh, in the foreign office for, uh, and been a British diplomat for over 20 years. I, I knew people within the defence establishment I could reach out to. And I was told directly, this is rubbish. Important and has no way of telling where it was made. There is no evidence whatsoever that it is made in Russia. Um, and that they are not saying it was made in Russia. But this has been made up by, uh, by Boris Johnson. Uh, and, um, so I knew they were lying on day one. And with that knowledge, you know, the story became more and more strange. Um, the idea that two Russian agents in broad daylight walk into a small suburban housing estate exactly where the houses are very close together, modern housing estate, and exactly the kind of middle-class housing estate where everybody's twitching their curtains and looking to see what the neighbor's doing. These two Russian agents walk up there. They're, they're handling Novichok, if it were. This is the official story. They're handling a substance of which a tiniest speck on your skin can kill you. So that has to be handled with some care. And they're painting it onto a doorknob. Now, how, how do you paint it onto a doorknob so carefully that you get no splash on your face? I and mean, anybody who's ever painted their home uh, knows that as you're uh, painting with a paintbrush, 
bits are likely to um, you, you know fly off and, and, and hit you. So of course it's possible to do, but it takes care. They would have to have been wearing protective clothing. They would have to have been wearing protective gloves. But it's now being alleged of some kind of syringe that they use to, to apply for. But they you've got these two Russian blokes in suburbia and the um, the building itself it's a very modern little house with no no fence just and, and the front door is only about five yards in five steps in from the pavement from the street so anyone can see absolutely exposed uh, close by you've got you know, two Russian men who presumably must at least have had goggles and, and rubber gloves uh, applying this substance, presumably with enormous care, uh, to the doorknob and then disappearing off. Um, and there's no CCTV of them on that street at all. You have a man here who is a senior defector from the Russian security services who is living in, put there, living in, you know, safe housing by the British security services. Well, he's living in his own name. He's not been given a new name. You know, he's, he's Sergei Skripal, the ex-Russian spy, the ex-double agent. And you don't even have closed circuit television on his house. I mean, I, I, I've got closed circuit television. You know, in the modern world, I've got CCTV on, on my house in case of Berkeley. And, I think almost all my neighbours do. They, and um, the idea that nobody's camera anywhere picked up these guys uh, <laughs> walking along that particular street. These Russian agents, were, it does seem now, it does seem, I didn't believe this at the time, it does seem they were, in fact, Russian agents in Salisbury that day. But we don't know why they were there. You know, we, we don't know... If some spy game was going on. Perhaps they thought they were collecting the Skripals to take them back to Russia because there's, there appears to be some evidence that these, uh, that Sergei Skripal was thinking of defecting back or thinking of going back. And it may well be that's what his daughter came to see him um, about. Maybe they thought they were collecting him. Maybe they were set up in, uh, in that way. Maybe they were collecting him and the British government decided it was better to... Um, uh, to kidnap him and incapacitate him than allow the Russians to take him home. We don't, we don't know. But the thing, and um, just to give you know another impossibility in the official story, uh, these two people who were one male, one female, one much older, they have one his daughter. The story is that they touched this Novichok which is meant to kill you in seconds. And then they went out and walked around town and then went to a restaurant and ate a three-course meal with the Novichok on their fingers. They ate a three-course meal with wine, apparently feeling fine, showing no signs of distress. Then they walked outside the restaurant and then instantly were incapacitated, both of them, at the same moment, at least three hours from when they could have touched another job. That's just absolute nonsense. Yeah, the, the idea it took three hours to have any effect at all, and then they were both instantly incapacitated so neither of them could ask for help. That can't be true. If they genuinely were incapacitated, they were incapacitated then. And discovered by... Uh who discovered them. Yes, it was the, again, by another total coincidence, the very first person to walk past them after they were incapacitated, the very first person to walk past them to discover them happened to be the chief nurse of the British Army, <laughs> who, who is an expert in chemical warfare, and that, who you know, just was in Salisbury shopping about the or, or whatever with her daughter <laughs> and happened to come across them um, and again how can people believe this the obvious nonsense it, it just cannot be it cannot be true um, and there's you know, there's so much more the uh, uh, there was um, one of the policemen who's one of the first policemen to go to the uh, 
script out of the house. Um, he got um, another chop on him, allegedly, and was hospitalised. Um, he went home before it took effect. Um, and the game was walking around his home fine, and then became ill. Um, in walking around his home, he sped it all over the house. You know, he sped it on internal um, doorknobs. He sped it um, on light switches. He sped it on um, cutlery in the kitchen, on cups, etc. And he had a wife and children. Um, and they continued living in the house. He was taken into hospital. For the next 48 hours, they were living in the house, which had Novichok on the, the light switches and the doorknobs and, and, and the cups and, and the plates. And, and, um, and yet none of them, and this is a substance which allegedly, a, a, a size of it you cannot see, an invisible amount of it will kill you. Um, and these little children and his wife weren't... Um, weren't hurt at all by, by this Novichok or supposedly all over the house. None of them became ill in the least. And when asked why, the, the, when, you know, when this was put to spokesmen for the government, um, how that can have happened, the, the official reply was, it must have been a miracle. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually the official answer to this. Well, that, that was a miracle. Um, so, well, that's okay then. You, you know, this story is really making sense now. We, we, we've now got divine intervention as part of it as well. Um, and then three months later, this unfortunate lady, Dawn Sturgis, is killed. Um, and the story there is that her, her boyfriend or, or, or companion, um, who um, lived from, you know, he, he was a street person effectively. Um, he lived from scavenging a lot and he, he was stealing material from charity collection bins. And he took uh, this bottle of perfume which he says was brand new and sealed with the cellophane wrapper, you know, thin cellophane wrapper you get over the cardboard on perfume bottles, intact. Um, he took this bottle of per he got this bottle of perfume and he gave it to uh, Dawn Sturgis as a present, as a gift. Um, and uh, she um, put some of the perfume on herself um, and he also put some on his arm to test it um, uh, and she died unfortunately I, and she did you know, she is the, the real casualty and tragedy in this she, she actually died um, but again this story doesn't make sense because Why did she die when the Skripals didn't die? And um, as the lawyer for her family has said today, it had um, an almost instant effect on her, whereas on the, on the Skripals it had a three-hour delayed effect before taking an effect at all. Why? You know, what, how can that be? And then there's a fundamental question. That charity bin that he stole it from was emptied every two weeks. It was a collection bin in town where people can go and if they're throwing out stuff, they can donate it to be sold in a charity shop to do good in charity. Now, every two weeks, the charity would come and empty out the stuff and take it to the shop to sell it. How did... The official story is that the Russian spies threw it in a charity bin. And the official story is the Russian spies came with the perfume bottle, opened the perfume bottle, unsealed that thin cellophane wrapper, which always tears when you, uh, when you unseal it, because partly it is a seal, it, it's, it's so you know that the perfume is, is genuine. Uh, uh, <laughs> unwrapped that, that so took out the perfume bottle, which contained the Novichok, um, unscrewed it, carefully applied it to the thing. Then they put that all back in its box carefully. Then somehow 
in the street, remember, they managed to reapply the coat with cellophane, thin cellophane uh, cover and glue that up again so you couldn't see it had ever been opened. And then instead of, you know, I don't know, throwing it in a river which they were walking past or, or, or putting it in a, a dustbin, they went and put it in a charity collection bin. Why? And then where it miraculously failed to be picked up for three months, in which time that bin was emptied six times and nobody picked up this perfume bottle when the bin was emptied six times. It's a nonsense story. It cannot be true. You know, it's just plain obvious nonsense. And yet, the entire media run with this nonsense story. Um, there's so many other things, but there's so many other things I can say on it. The, um, when the police, when um, Don Sturgis died, and the police sealed off um, Rowley's, Charlie Rowley, her boyfriend. It was in his flat. They sealed off his flat um, in order to search for the Novichok that had killed her, because inside the things Novichok that had killed her. They searched for five days. And on the fifth day, they found this perfume bottle in the house after five days sitting on the kitchen counter it was sitting on the kitchen counter now you're a policeman you've gone into a house that, you know, 12 policemen have gone into the house and you've been told you are looking for a small bottle of liquid and there is on the kitchen counter a bottle of perfume and you spend five days finding it you know, it, 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 it just Again, it cannot be true. It makes no sense. It, it's as though they're kind of laughing at us by producing a narrative so implausible uh, that no sane people could, person could possibly believe it. Yet it has been entirely accepted by the mainstream media. Anybody who doubts it or expresses any doubt is immediately massively derided on social media and, and on, sometimes in mainstream media. Um, and, and you're right, this was used to fuel, you know, this idea of, and of course the government line is that not just were the Skripals attacked and John Sturgis killed, this could have killed a million people. You know, if it had got into the water supply, this Novichok is so dangerous, it could have killed a million people. It couldn't even kill Sergei Skripal, because <laughs> Sergei Skripal uh, did not die, uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge. Sergei Skripal did not die. Um, that's the official claim. Nobody's seen him, but officially he, it, it did not kill him. Well, it can't be that powerful. I know how it's going to kill a million people if it can't kill Sergei Skripal, but the, this was made into this tremendous rush, and people were terrified. You know, they managed to get people really scared that the Russians are going to be poisoning our water supply. You, you had people. You know, only drinking bottled water and that kind of thing, in case the Russians had got up the water supply. This, this nuts, mad, extreme Cold War narrative um, story uh, to, to ramp up anti-Russian hysteria. And of course, that's a, that's a prelude of much that's, that's come since. So now we've gone from this Gripal affair to the Ukraine proxy war, where the British military is playing a leading role. The first Challenger tank, the first British talent Challenger tank was destroyed on the battlefield. Uh, the British national security military apparatus often seems more fanatically invested in this proxy war than the U.S. leadership does. And I wonder why you think that is. I mean, it was Boris Johnson who parachuted into Kiev in April 2022 to convince Zelensky not to negotiate. Why is Britain playing this role? Or, or, or do, do, and do you agree with my view that the, the British are, are more invested than the Americans in many ways, ideologically? It's extraordinary because the British political elite and the British leadership class 
I've been accepting money from Russian oligarchs for years, and I'm extremely closely linked with them. Um, and then there's this sudden Russophobic turnaround, which has been absolutely extraordinary. And I don't know whether some of the um, extreme vehemence of it is because of that, because because they've been so complicit in accepting funds from Russian oligarchs. And let's be honest, um, you know, many of the Russian oligarch class did not get their funds that legally in the first place in, in Russia, which in large part was the United States fault and, and their, um, their pushing of the extreme privatization program uh, uh, where the United States advisors who were designing it uh, in the time of Yeltsin, um, they formally, they actually took the view but it did not matter if state property was stolen by mafia gangsters, um, because as long as you got it into the private sector, that's what counted. And it was private sector, and they they even had a formal view. And I mean, I I was in government at the time. You know, I I discussed it with them. They they took a formal view that mafia capitalism is a stage of capitalist development that you have to go through. So um, uh, so they. I wouldn't say they were encouraging gangsters to take over uh, Russian factories and mineral assets and that kind of thing, but they were cert- they certainly viewed it as not a problem. Um, and, and that's another part of the same complicity, if, if, if you like. And the British ruling class were, more than anybody, uh, benefited from association with and, and receipt of Russian oligarch money. And I think partly then their anti-Russian vehemence now is in order to cover up their connections with, <laughs> with dirty Russian money in the past. That, that's my. I think it's partly that. Um, and also, I'm, I thought it has to be said that the United Kingdom and, and England in particular has been for centuries a nation particularly open to jingoism and uh, xenophobia and militarism. You know, that's part of the culture. That's an ingrained part of the culture. Um, and I think that also play, plays a part. War is nearly always popular in, in, in the UK, but a large part of the population of the media can get them whipped, whipped up. We constantly hear from neocons and US militarists that if the US doesn't give Ukraine everything it needs and go all in on the Ukraine proxy war that China will take the lesson that it's okay to invade Taiwan. Do you think it's possible that the US with the UK, Australia and other vassal states like Japan and the Philippines could actually engage in a military confrontation with China? And how dangerous is this Cold War style rhetoric that we constantly hear about China in our media now, whether it's in the UK or the US? Well, I think my first part of my answer would be to say that China cannot take Taiwan because Taiwan's Chinese. (laughs) They can't take their own territory. Um, And I believe it in the formal legal position is that even the government of Taiwan doesn't dispute it's part of China. It merely thinks it is the government of the whole of China, which is a rather different uh, different thing. Uh, uh, and you know, the legacy of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, but um, it seems to me highly improbable, highly improbable that the Chinese would will in fact attack. Uh, Taiwan. I think they're gradually economically reabsorbing it and, and will eventually succeed in reabsorbing it and should do it. It is part of China. Um, China is very interesting because I can think in human history, I cannot think of a country that has achieved the economic dominance that China now has in the world without seeking to convert that economic dominance into territorial expansion. We keep being told of Chinese military aggression. Where, where is this Chinese military aggression? No, who's who's China invaded? Uh, when people say Tibet, and I I accept there's a certain validity that that was a long while ago. I mean, do you have any idea how many countries the United States has invaded since China invaded Tibet? <laughs> uh, China is not an aggressive military 
power. Yes, there's some dispute over uh, the Spratly Islands and their status according to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and, and, and how much of the South China Sea should be Chinese. That's a maritime dispute. That's not a major uh, act of international aggression in any sense. Um, and the United States can't survive without China. You know, China provides uh, particularly, particularly the earth minerals, but many other commodities which, which the United States needs. If you buy anything on Amazon, uh, any manufactured good at all, the, the chances of it being made in China are very high, <laughs> probably more than two to one. Uh, the, uh, China has become absolutely an integrated part of, of the economy. Why, why would you, why is the United States so determined to treat China as an enemy and to promote China? I, and they're now absolute plans to surround China by, by more nuclear weapons in a threatening manner. You know, and um, why Australia is going on with this is even more extraordinary because Australia, of course, um, uh, you know, the United States is determined to fight Russia until the death of the last Ukrainian. Uh, and I can see they'd be quite happy to get into a limited conflict with China until the death of the last Australian. <laughs> but, but I don't see what, what's in it for Australia. Um, it, it's, China is not an enemy. You know, China is a powerful state, which is both a partner in trade and, of course, a competitor in trade in certain other markets, Africa in particular. It doesn't make it as an enemy. Uh, uh, this extraordinary need to feed the military industrial complex by converting other states into enemies by dint of your own hostility, that, that's what has caused the Ukraine war. And the Ukraine war, my own view, um, simply because of my, my background and training, I. To me, it's important. My own view is that the invasion of Ukraine, as part, which of course is part of a chain of events over years, but the, the, invasion, the most recent invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces of the Ukrainian church was not legal. I think it was illegal in international law. But it was certainly provoked. Uh, it was extremely uh, provoked. In the same way, if you like, that um, you know, if we were uh, somewhere in a bar and you kept coming up to me and calling me fat and ugly and saying you slept with my wife and, and that kind of thing, and then I eventually hit you. Okay, it was illegal. I shouldn't have hit you, but it was certainly provoked. <laughs> and uh, that's maybe our homespun example. But the, the United States did everything it could to goad Russia into the invasion of Ukraine, and. We seem to be at the start of a similar process towards China, where the United States are doing everything it possibly can to provoke military action by China. If China does invade uh, Taiwan, it'll be because the United States goaded them into it. Ambassador Craig Murray, thanks so much for speaking to us at the Gray Zone. Good luck.